Politics is the first lens and religion is downstream of politics. From Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief Radio. I'm Interfaith Alliance President, Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch, broadcasting this week from New York City. So now what we're seeing more and more in the data is that people are picking their churches based on their political partisanship. 60 Minutes has hailed Ryan Burge as one of the leading data analysts on religion and politics. At a time when data is plentiful, but cogent analysis, not so much. I'm really looking forward to getting his insights. The idea that someday the other side is going to just wake up, that conservatives are somehow asleep or stupid or uninformed, that's that's both false and patronizing. That's Rabbi Dr. Jay Michelson. Jay's great at cutting through complicated arguments to focus on what's most important and where progress is most possible. And he'll be with us to do just that in this week's show. You can hear State of Belief on the radio and listen on Apple Podcasts and all other podcast platforms. Every week I am in conversation with the most fascinating and impactful civic and religious leaders across the nation. Please subscribe to it today. State of Belief Radio is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest. Dr. Ryan Burge is Assistant Professor of Political Science, as well as Graduate Coordinator at Eastern Illinois University. He is an expert on statistical analysis at the intersection of religion and politics. His books include 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America and The Nuns, Where They Came From, who they are, and where they are going, which has just been released in an updated, expanded second edition last month. Ryan, welcome to State of Belief Radio. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. Appreciate being here. This is really a timely conversation. What I love about what you do is you paint a picture using statistics. And uh, that is such a gift for the rest of us who mostly live in, the, in our imagination and sometimes fantasy land about what's really happening. And you bring us back to earth and you say, okay, this is really what the map looks like. This is what the reality is on the ground. Where did you come from? Like, how did you get involved in this super specific kind of career? It's not for everyone. No, it's not for most people, I would say. And and other people have said, I want to do what you do. And I go, you don't understand what it takes to get where I where I've gotten in my life. It's been a long, uh, a winding process. I started grad school in 2005. Uh, I thought I was just going to get a master's degree in political science and then go work for government or so. I didn't know what I was going to do, honestly. But after I finished my master's thesis, my advisor came to me and goes, hey, you're kind of good at this. You should probably think about going on and getting the PhD and uh, my university had a PhD program. So I just basically continued on in the PhD program. And I was a very cookie cutter academic early in my career where I was, I was writing statistical stuff, but it was very jargony, very like high level, very boring, not very visual and trying to publish articles in peer reviewed, you know, uh, outlets so I could get a job. And then about six or seven years ago, I decided that that was not going to fulfill my life. It did not give me the sense of accomplishment that I wanted it to. And so I thought, why don't I kind of pivot my work and make it more public facing and less academic facing? Not saying that the work I do is not academic still. It's just the goal is to make the work accessible to an an average reader. I always think my average reader is a guy with a two-year college degree who works a blue-collar job who just wants to understand the world in a better way. So moving away from tables and regression, moving towards graphs and visuals, and trying to uh, write in a way that's that's quick and, and and concise, but also you know it really descriptive of what the data says. And the other thing I've really focused on is just trying to be a neutral referee. You know, I don't I try not to play for any team on the left or the right. Sometimes I write pieces that the left gets mad at. Sometimes I write pieces that the right gets mad at. But my job is just to tell you here's what I think the data says in the most objective, neutral, 
uh, way possible. And then if you want to fight about it, you fight about it, but don't yell at me. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> I, th- I sense that I really do. And I think that, um, I also applaud the effort to move the Academy into facing the public and offering the important wisdom and knowledge of the Academy to the public. You know, I used to fight about that all the time. When I, when I started HuffPost Religion at the same time I was working at Princeton, I was like, to my, some of my colleagues, I was like, not everybody's going to be able to come to be at your eight person seminar at Princeton, but you have something to say about a, a religion in America, something that we all need to hear. Tell us, say it in a way that people can understand it. And I really, I really appreciate that mentality from the academy coming from a, a background of, of academics whose work was meant to be accessible. I just think it's really, really great. And I also appreciate that you're not above using social media. People can find you, they can learn from you and you, and you just, you do, you put it out there. And so it's, I just want to say, I appreciate it. I know that it like brands you as a super nerd and that's fine. You, you know, you, (laughs) you, I don't, I listen, I've been a nerd my whole life, but here's what I realized. Like no one pays you for being kind of good at something. They pay you for being really good at one little niche. Find your niche and just do it as best as you possibly can, better than anybody else on earth. And that's how you get paid. That's how you get publicity. That's how you get notoriety. And for me, that's how I get satisfaction. I get more satisfaction right. when I see a post you know, go viral on Substack or a quote I gave show up in the New York Times than I do about publishing an article in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion, which is a great journal, don't get me wrong, but that is not going to get me any farther in my career than I am right now. I'm never going to go teach at Harvard. Uh, my, my academic pedigree is not that good. I went to a very low-ranked undergraduate institution. I went to a very low-ranked graduate institution because I didn't know any different. Um, so therefore, I have a really kind of a ceiling on where I can go in academia. I really can't break into like the top tier. So why not take my position and, and say – that's not the road for me. I'm going to pick that road over there. I'm going to create my own road that direction and then drive down that road as far as I can go. Listen, you're too young to say never say never, but I do hear an accent. Now, it sounds like you might have <laughs> grown up in a place where religion had a role in society. Did you grow up? Am I right yeah. in hearing a yeah. Southern accent? Yeah, I grew up, well, I grew up in Southern Illinois. So I've got oh, a little bit. You know what? That's so funny. You're you're in Southern Illinois, which is actually the South. People do not realize that Southern Illinois mm-hmm. is the South. <laughs> People think like you're Illinois, so you're a blue state, but we're a lot closer to Kentucky than we are to Chicago. If you leave my house and drive north, and I leave and drive south, I'll hit Little Rock, Arkansas before you hit Chicago. Like For that's sure. how far. So <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we are a very. I grew up Southern Baptist in a very yeah. small town in rural Illinois, and I was raised Southern. I mean, I was there all the time, two three times a week. Vacation Bible school, the whole uh, youth camp, yeah, the whole yeah. nine. And I was a youth pastor at 20 years old. And uh, I'm also a pastor as well. I pastor First Baptist Church of Mount Vernon, Illinois, which is an American Baptist church. And I've been um, part of the ABC USA for almost 20 years now. And I'm actually going to be voted on to join the Board of General Ministries of ABC USA uh, next Woo! month. So Woo! Well, you know, I, I, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm ABC as well. My people, there's like seven yeah. I of mean, us. I, that is amazing. And I became an American Baptist in seminary, and uh, I feel very connected with that tradition. But this <laughs> is there. I, I will just say there are a lot of cool American Baptists out there. Okay, done. We are going to get into the statistic moment. Okay, okay. something just came out. The religion census just mm-hmm. came out. Mm-hmm. This is one every ten years. It just came out. It's a snapshot. In 2020, they've been compiling the data. We have actually the snapshot of religion in America. This is major. And so you've been putting it up on social media, but where can people Mm -hmm. find this if they want to go look at it themselves? So there's a great resource called ARDA, the ARDA, the Association of Religion Data Archives, which is basically this big repository where all this religion data lives And the religion census is posted there every 10 years where you can go and download that data for free. But they also have other religion data there you can grab. It's uh, it's funded by Lilly. So, I mean, it's a perpetual thing. I have lots of friends that work for them. If you are interested at all in religion and data, it is a great – I you literally go there probably three or four times a week just to look for different – like there's something going on like on Twitter, right? People are talking about purgatory. Is there any question about purgatory I can find? Well, I would go to ARDA and I would look. The A-R-D-A. T-H-E-A-R-D-A. 
That's really important to know so that people feel like empowered to look at statistics themselves. Investigate religion yourself. This is not something that you have to wait for, you know, brilliant people like Ryan to help <laughs> discern it for you. You you can do it. But what you have written some really provocative, I would say, I mean, not not in a negative sense, but really yeah. smart and make you think kind of articles about what you see in the religion census as far as where America is religion wise. And also, and we're going to get to this in a second, what it might mean for the 2024 election. You, so you've done, you've been showing up in a few places about this. Let's just start with what strikes you. Not Mm -hmm. necessarily politically, but what strikes you in general about this uh, census data that we have right now? So the one thing that I think is really important is when you compare 2020 to 2010, because you can compare county level, by the way. Here's what makes the religion census really good. It's county level data. It's almost impossible to get county level data on religion because you just you can't do that through a survey. You need to survey, you know, 10 million people to do that. So to get county level, what they do is they go to every denomination in America and ask to see their membership numbers for every church in every county in the in the United States. So it takes a long, it takes two years for them to compile all this data and analyze it and provide it to us. If you compare 2010 to 2020, the biggest shift I see is the decline in religion is probably not where you think it is. It is not in the coasts, right? People think obviously the Pacific Northwest or maybe even New England. The biggest drop in religion in America is happening like through the central plains and the upper Midwest. So places like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, the Dakotas. We're seeing in some counties like in northern Iowa, the share of people who are attached to a religious congregation dropped by 12 or 15 percent just between 2010 and 2020 in Iowa. And there's many counties like that in Minnesota. So it's not where you think religion's declining is declining. It's declining in probably flyover country, rural Midwestern places where people think that religion is still a very important part. It's losing its hold every single day, it seems like. Mm. So where are they going? Are they part of the nuns? Are they becoming committed atheists? Do we do we have any information? I mean, maybe that's not what that census does, but you've done other research where you're <laughs> investigating, like, when you leave an organized religion, when you leave, like, a denomination or something like that, where do you go? Typically nowhere. I mean, that's uh, the answer uh-huh. is a, a lot. But I'll, I'll put my social science hat on for a second and I kind of talk this through how I think about it. So when we see religion decline, it can only be really two things. One is people leaving religion, which is the one that I think that like the average person, when they hear these numbers, thinks, well, that's people who used to go and now don't go. That's part of it. But I think what another part of it is that most people don't realize is what I call generational replacement, which is just the idea that every day in America, old folks die. And every day in America, young people turn 18. So every day in America, we're seeing the older generation that's much more religious. 71% of the greatest generation identifies as Protestant or Catholic. They're being replaced every day in America by Generation Z coming of age, becoming 18 years old, and only 37% of Generation Z identifies as Protestant or Catholic. So in a lot of these places, what you're seeing is old religious people dying and be and not being replaced by anyone because the younger generation is not coming into adulthood as part of a religious tradition. So that's a big aspect of how religion changes in America. People think it's like people leaving the pews. No, it's people dying and no no uh-huh. one replacing them. Now, some people do leave religion. That's a fact. But when most people leave religion, they it happens when they're younger. Most people, if they're going to leave religion, they've done it by their 25th birthday. Very few people leave religion in their 50s, 60s, 70s. And when they leave, by the way, it's almost always a gradual process. It's not like where you you don't see a whole lot of people who are weekly attenders for 30 years and then become never attenders on one day and never go back. You know, it's, it's the, it's the monthly people, you know, like the 12 times a year, people become eight times a year. And then next year they're four times a year. And then next year they're once. And then the next year they're none. That's Uh how people typically leave religion. It's not, we like to think it's like this high minded thing where people leave religion over like theology or politics or LGBT or whatever it is. Most people just stop attending because it just doesn't work for them. They're too tired. They can't work it in their schedule, and they don't feel like it provides them a net benefit, so they just stop going. Yeah, that's – I mean, that's a reality. However, you also wrote in a very interesting article – I know you don't choose headlines, so it probably wasn't the headline you would have chose, but did did Trump um, accelerate 
the decline of religious attention. And and mm-hmm. that, I think, was like Trump was almost a stand in for politics. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, but but that can have an effect on how people decide whether or not to show up on a Sunday morning or, you know, af- affiliate themselves with a with a, a congregation. So th- there's this really interesting thing that's going on in political science over the last about 10 years or so. We used to always assume in this field, religion and politics, that religion was the first lens and politics is downstream of that. So like you you, you figure out who you're going to vote for by reading the Bible or the Quran, by talking to your pastor, by you know praying about it, those kind of things. In the last 10 years, we kind of realized that that's not how people make decisions. Um, politics is the first lens and religion is downstream of politics. So now what we're seeing more and more in the data is that people are picking their churches based on their political partisanship. So if I'm a Republican, I'm not going to go to the the local Episcopal church because they're going to talk about things I don't like. Or uh, the converse of that is I'm a a Democrat or even center left. I'm not going to go to the Pentecostal evangelical church in town because they're going to talk about gay people in a way I don't like. So people are picking their they're, they're sorting themselves out. And, and, and partisanship is the master identity, and everything is sort of like enslaved to that identity. And if you look at the data, the share of Americans who are liberal, who are non-religious, is about 50 percent now. Amongst conservatives, is about 15 percent. So, I mean, yeah. it's clear in the data that people are leaving church at some level, at some point. Politics is one of the factors that is pushing them out. As someone who has, you know, attends a church and a more progressive church and – and was a pastor of, of those <laughs> kind of churches. It laments me that the idea is, is that the more progressive you are, the less you attend church. And I wonder if that does that hold true across races, or is that like is that something that is? I mean, sorry to like really really dumb this down, but is that a white thing, or is that like <laughs> how does that manifest itself? How does yeah. how does race come into this? Yeah, so I mean, it, it is a white thing, Paul. To be to be dead honest with you, it's so religion works differently for non-white people versus white people. Like that's just it's it's clear as can be in the data. If you like, just do it like a gradient of how often you attend services and who you voted for in twenty twenty. For white people, it's a huge gradient. Like sixty five percent of never attenders voted for Biden, but then you go up to the weekly plus attenders who attend more than once a week. Seventy percent of them voted for Trump. Like it's literally like a mirror opposite as you go up the attendance spectrum. Amongst uh, non-white people, there is a difference, but it's only 10 points. And they're still uh-huh. majority Democrat between um, never attending and more than once a week attending. So it's like – I think it goes like 60, uh, 70% to 60% for Biden. So it does decline some, but n- I mean for white people, it's, it's, it's religion equals conservative. For for right. non-white people, it's religion equals slightly less liberal, but not very much. It is so interesting, and we would be having a completely different conversation in the fifties and sixties. There would have been much more parity in those times. We're not killing the messenger here. This is not Ryan's fault. He's just reporting rather than like than opining. Uh, it's just a reality. How does this work? Also, with other traditions, is is the religion census not? It's not just a Christian. Uh, census, right? It's a uh, it's other traditions as well. They they try their very best to be as inclusive as they possibly can be uh, for every you know major faith group. So they do Baha'i. You know, uh-huh. people are people are amazed. Like you know, Rain Wilson's a Baha'i, and he got he wrote a book that just came out. Baha'i Baha'i actually is a, in a lot of parts of America that people don't realize. There's a Muslim estimate. There's a Hindu estimate. Um, so they really try their best to. Get, but it, at some point, it becomes like uh, people always ask me about like Amish people. Like, I don't know anything about Amish people. They don't answer surveys for God's sake. So I can't really <laughs> figure out, you know, like what's up with the Amish Even if you people. send it in an email? <laughs> yeah. Even if you send it in the mail, I don't think they would, they would respond to it. <laughs> right, but right, right. I, I right. think that's the, that's the hard thing about, and people don't fully realize this. Like it is, it's hard to measure anything. It is extra hard to measure religion, especially for these small groups. Not saying they don't matter because they do. But just how, you know, logistically, yeah. you can only do so much for you have to kind of throw your hands up and go, we can't measure those kind of groups. Well, and also, I think I, I think that, you know, with with mainline Christians, Catholics, um, there is like networks that you can tap into with yes. Muslims. It's it's it's, I think, probably harder with some non-denominational, uh, you know, you can't you can't do a kind of a top down 
Um, okay, everybody, let's answer this, you know, this uh, survey. So, um, but, but do talk to me a little bit about how you see what, any trends you see in the non-Christian, where, you know, Interfaith Alliance is an interfaith organization yeah. that works with people from all faith traditions and, and as well as secular groups. How, what, what can we learn about mm-hmm. non, um, non-Christian or, uh, groups? Yeah, I think if you look at them just spatially, like look at the map, yeah. A lot of them tend to be concentrated around the coasts, you know, especially uh-huh. like around New York City and in Boston and places like that on the East Coast. And then uh, in, in Southern California on the West Coast and maybe up into the Pacific Northwest a little bit. But a lot of like Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims are, are very geographically concentrated, which makes perfect sense. Right. If I'm moving to a new country, I'm going to go move where there are people like me in that country I'm going to. So I at least have some connection with, you know, the culture that I understand more. So I think for people who live in most of America, they're only exposed to really, you know, Catholicism, Protestant Christianity and in non-religion. You know, in, in many uh-huh. counties in America, that's that's all you get. You might have maybe a Jewish congregation, but might be three counties away, a Muslim congregation, but it's five counties away. Most of America is not very religiously diverse uh-huh. um, in terms of, you know, Protestant Christianity and Catholicism really rule the day across most of middle America. And it would be unusual, honestly. Like if, you, if I live in a county of 40,000 people in rural Illinois, downstate Illinois. I've always lived here. It's always just been where I've been at. I don't know if you said, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you can find a Muslim in, in Jefferson County, Illinois. I don't think I could find one. Um, uh-huh. Not yeah. saying they don't exist. It's just saying I don't have any connection with those folks because they probably don't even, I know there's no mosque in Mount Vernon. So they'd have to go somewhere yeah. else to even worship. So it's just right. hard to find non-Christian people in most of America. Yeah, which even that's that little notation it's, is a reminder of why sometimes it's easy to demonize others when, mm-hmm. this is my editorial, it's not what Ryan's saying, but it, I think it <laughs> is, if you're not if you're not in proximity to other people, and you don't have an ability to kind of, you know, shop together or, you know, be in a, a rotary club together or whatever, you don't you don't have the same ability to kind of humanize. And so demonization, it just it's I think these kind of statistics help us realize part of what can lead to the othering and a demonization of other people. And so we have to work extra hard to find ways for people to um, know how, how we can know one another. And um, you know what, well, Paul, the social science backs you up on this. There's something called social contact theory, which is the idea that if you have social contact with a, an out group, like a minority group, whether it be racial, religious, uh, sexual orientation, you become more tolerant of that group as a whole because now you've personified that group. You've made it right. a person like the guy I work at the car dealership with a Muslim. That dude's a good dude, you know, loves his family, wants to be a good person, good American. That must be Muslims are pretty OK people. So the you know the more we can mix with people who are different than us, the more tolerant we become of those differences. And I think that's something that's hard to do in rural America because it's very white, it's very Christian. I mean, it's it's so it's I think one of the reasons intolerance is so high in a lot of parts of America is just they don't have exposure to different ideas. Yeah, that's I mean it's really really important to remember. One one thing one uh, article you wrote was the implications of the changing religious demographics for the 2024 election, Mm -hmm. which was fascinating to me. And, you know, we've already talked about, like, the decline of religion, and that sounds like it would be good news for the Democrats. But there's also, it's not all that. Um, And it's also very much about location, location, location. Talk to me a little bit about how, how you understood these statistics as for how they will impact the 2024 election. Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is I wrote a piece for my Substack. My Substack's called Graphs About Religion, by the way. Graphsaboutreligion.com will get you there. I got to promote it. Uh, the piece I published this week if the nuns are rising, why are Democrats not just sweeping every election in America? Which is a really interesting question, right? Because if they're 30 percent of America and they lean Democrat, why are they not just killing it on you know in every congressional election? And the answer is because every, for every nun they've gained, they probably lost a bunch of white Christians along the way too. You know, white Christians used to be majority Democrat in the 1970s. Now they're they're 60 percent Republicans. So you know, for everybody they've gained, they've also lost on the other side. So that's that's part. You got to think about this mix, right? They've they've gained nuns, they've lost white Christians, and Republicans have have gained a lot of white Christians they wouldn't have had. 30 or 40 years ago. So where does this come into play? Well, there's a couple of places, I think, in America where you can clearly see the Republicans are going, they're building a red wall, a stronghold. Um, 
Florida is a clear example. Florida is not a purple state anymore. Florida is a, a red state and getting redder by the day. And that's large. If you look at like Miami Dade County, which is where obviously Miami, Florida is, it was, it used to be a solid stronghold for Democrats. And Biden only won it by 10 points in, in 2020. And a big reason that the, the share of uh, Miami Dade County that's attached to a religious tradition rose 12% between 2010 and 2020. It became a lot more religious over the last 10 years. And obviously, where's that coming from? Hispanics. A lot of Hispanic immigrants coming from places like Cuba and Central and South America and bringing their Catholicism with them and setting down roots. They are is culturally- it Catholicism? Is it yeah, or, but- or is it also uh, evangelical? Let's do uh, evangelical. So, so very few of them uh, bring evangelicalism here. Many of them bring their Catholicism here, and then they choose what they want to be after that. You know, some some of them choose to stay Catholic. Some of them become even. I think a lot of Hispanics become evangelical as a way to assimilate to the American culture. Because that's kind of like they see that as like the proper American religion is is evangelicalism. Mm. And mm. then some of them become nuns. I think if they're left leaning, they become nuns because that's again, that's assimilating to American culture. So Miami Dade County is part of it. But if you look at like the Rio Grande Valley, all those little counties that are like on the border between Mexico and, and South Texas, uh Star County, Maverick County, there's a little county down there. It's got it's called Maverick County, it has fifteen thousand people. The share who were attached to a religious tradition was thirty three percent in two thousand ten. In 2020, it was 77% of people in Stark County are part of religious tradition, and they shifted 40 points to the red, to the Republican side, between 2016 and 2020 in the presidential election. So I think that the Republicans are seeing they can make gains with Hispanic Catholics and Hispanic evangelicals who are culturally conservative on issues like LGBTQ, abortion, things like that. So I don't think Texas is going to turn blue really at all. And I don't think Florida is even in play anymore. So I think the Democrats have lost those states now. Well, OK, so why are they not losing all these elections? Because if you look at places like we just talked about in the in the Midwest of the country, places even like Michigan and in like uh, Pennsylvania. So I talk about Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is like a wealthy suburb of Philly. Um, they, they the, the amount of the share of people who are religious dropped 18 percent between 2010 and 2020. And that place shifted from being a toss up to being five points for Biden. In 2020. So you're seeing like these suburban counties, these Midwest suburban counties are losing religion rapidly, and that has become a net gain for the Democrats. And that's how they're going to push back against losing Texas, losing Florida. They're going to have Republicans are going to have a harder and harder time, I think, winning a state like Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania because of the decline of religion in those places. This is fascinating. And um, what are you working on now? Do you have anything up your sleeve that you can give us a preview of? Uh, a couple things. Uh, I'm writing. So I actually I was just writing a Substack before I got on with you about um, religious belief in America, how it's still incredibly robust. Half of Americans still believe in God without a doubt. Only 14 percent take an atheist or agnostic view of God. So, you know, there's still a lot of religion. People in America, there are seven times more people in America who believe in God without a doubt than say God doesn't exist. Seven uh-huh. times more, seven seven percent versus fifty percent. So there's a lot more belief in America. So the Substack I'm publishing twice a week. The other thing is I just signed a book contract uh, with Oxford University Press to write a textbook about American religious demography. It's called The American Religious Landscape: Facts, Trends, and the Future. And it's going to be a textbook that's written for high school students and college students to basically get them to understand what's going on in American religion, what groups are growing, what groups are declining, why they're declining, where they are geographically in America. Kind of a nice primer, a nice handbook on what American religion looks like now. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And and, and for as someone who who talks about his humble, humble education to be publishing with Oxford University Press. I mean, you know, he's going to be president of Harvard before we know it. So <laughs> we, we knew Ryan when. But so, Ryan, what, one of the things I like to um, ask everyone at the end is, is what gives you hope right now? You're a nonpartisan stati- statistician, I think mm-hmm. I'm trying to say. Yeah, um right. And uh, an academic, but you're also a pastor. You're also mm-hmm. a human. So, like right now, when you look for hope, where where do you see it? When I think about it, I think about the average person in America is still a good person. You know, I think we hear these stories on the news that say like this person beat up this homeless man. We think, oh God, humanity is awful. But for every one story you hear like that, there's a hundred stories you don't hear about a person doing a kindness for someone else. 
that just goes unreported and, and unremarkable. And in my life, I've seen thousands of instances of average people doing the right thing and helping someone out when they didn't. Humanity is a good thing. The world, there is no, and I mean this with every fiber of my being, there's no better time to be alive than right now. And I mean that. If you get cancer, would you get cancer now or 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 100 years ago? The answer is right now. The number of people who die from grinding abject poverty is lower today than it's been at any point in recorded history. The amount of wars and conflicts today are lower than they've been at any point in recorded history. Would you rather be a black person in America today or 50 years ago? The answer is today. You'd rather be a woman in America today or 50 years ago? The answer is today. You know, We've got a long way to go, but we've made a lot of progress in this country. And we are, we are becoming a more perfect union every single day, and I'm hopeful that we can continue that. We live in a beautiful, wonderful place at a wonderful time in history. Everything's amazing, and no one's happy. Can we just respect the fact that we live in a great time? And I think we need that perspective sometimes. We need someone to come and tap us on the shoulder and go, what are you complaining about? Your life is better than uh, objectively 95% of people who have ever lived and you're mad about it. We need to look towards all the good things that we have and the positive balance we've made. And the world is a nicer, kinder, less brutal place today than it's ever been. Dr. Ryan Burge teaches political science at Eastern Illinois University and writes widely on the trends that define religion and politics in the country today. His important book, The Nuns, Where They Came From, Who They Are, and Where They Are Going, has just been released in an updated, expanded second edition. He has a substack, which everyone should read, and that is graphsaboutreligion.com. Ryan, thank you so much for being with us today on State of Belief Radio. Really appreciate all your work. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Coming up next, Rabbi Dr. J. Michelson on America's idolatry of guns. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of State of Belief anytime on our website. You'll also find links to the topics we discussed this week, extended interviews and transcripts, and an archive of past shows, all at stateofbelief.com. You're listening to State of Belief Radio, where religion and democracy meet. Rabbi Dr. J. Michelson is a commentator on CNN and a columnist for Rolling Stone. He was the Supreme Court columnist at the Daily Beast for eight years. J. is the author of 10 books, including bestselling God vs. Gay? The Religious Case for Equality, and is an affiliated professor at Chicago Theological Seminary. Jay holds a Ph.D. in Jewish thought from Hebrew University, a J.D. from Yale Law School, and a non-denominational rabbinic ordination. Jay, is there anything you can't do? I have disappointed my late mother, uh, my late Jewish mother, by not being a doctor. Okay, so this is something that you can move from here. Let, Jay, still you and I have Jewish guilt left uh, left to explore <laughs> in therapy. That's delighted, delighted to, that that we can start that way. Hey, Jay, you and I have known each other uh, since Huffington Post days. I think it's like you know, the, close to fifteen years. You've always been a brilliant commentator, saying what needed to be said. I'm really so glad you're on this show, which you have been on many times with uh, the the wonderful host, Welton Gaddy. Part of the reason that I wanted to have you on, aside from you being just the super smarty pants that you are, uh, is that I read something you wrote on, on Facebook around guns and religion. And you essentially said, we can no longer use the, uh, the exposition of facts and uh, like arguments to move the needle on gun violence in this country, because guns in this country have the similarity to religious belief. Can you say more about what you were getting at with that? Sure. Yeah, and I've I've been developing kind of some more writing about this uh, as as so it's a it's a it's a picture of me in mid thought or mid flight. 
You know, for me, I think a lot of times whenever there's an episode of a horrifying episode of gun violence, uh, liberals kind of wring our hands and we say, what's it going to take? How much more is it going to take? It's clear that the answer to that question is nothing. It's never going to be enough because like in a religious context, both sides have their narrative. So and any new facts are assimilated into that narrative. It's not like there would have to be some enormous catastrophe for the narrative to actually be shifted. So when an episode of gun violence happens, right? liberals think about guns, uh, conservatives think about mental health, which they don't mean mental health in the sort of psychoanalytic sense, but really it's spiritual health, that this is a symptom of a spiritual crisis uh, that needs religious remedies. Uh, you know, liberals ask, how come we can't have gun control? Uh, conservatives are, you know, and I say religious conservatives are hard right conservatives, not moderates, uh, say, oh, here they come coming for our freedom again. So the narratives are already in place and they've been that way now for at least a decade. Uh, the conservative narrative holds sway at the Supreme Court uh, and has impacted, you can see it in the language of several recent Supreme Court opinions, especially the most recent one, the Bruin case. And it's just not the idea that someday the other side is going to just wake up, that conservatives are somehow asleep or stupid or uninformed. That's that's both false and patronizing. They're not not informed. They're very informed. They have a different ideological map for understanding this crisis. And so I think we need to shift, at least in the sort of way we talk about this, away from this notion of like, we're trying to make some kind of court case and we can bring some evidence and toward language of recovery from religion and what it takes to shift someone from a sort of religious belief. And, you know, you and I have a background in this, particularly around civil rights and LGBTQ equality and religion that we know that just marshalling facts and evidence and talking, this is, this is not how it works. Right, that there have to there has to be a real personal impact, uh, either directly or knowing someone or encountering it even through the media, and these are the kinds of tools that I think we need to reach for uh, in the gun debate. Mm. Well, we're recording this on the one year anniversary of the Ovedi uh, shooting that happened, and what we have learned in that year is that this community has become deeply divided between those who uh, families that were directly impacted and who are have become advocates and for for some sort of sensible gun um, you know policy and an equally um, entrenched opposition to that uh, all living in the same town but you know again I'm not you know the, the proximity at least in this case is not enough to transform those who are suspicious. No, that's right. And, and look, there is a political element to this, which is, and I'm sure listeners know this, um, you know, of a large majority of Americans support what we would call sensible gun safety regulations, whether it's banning the AR-15 completely, whether it's background checks or other sort of what we might think of as common sense steps. And so a lot of this is a political issue about the kind of right wing capture of the Republican Party, right? So in a normal situation, if there's a party that has kind of its extreme wing and its more moderate wing, there might be some balance between those two. But since 2016, that hasn't been the case in the Republican Party. And to move at all from the dogma, the religious dogma, that this is about freedom, this is a core element. And again, this is this is a religious ideology. This is a core element of my autonomy as a human being, my dignity, it's also gendered, my dignity as a man, my strength, my ability to protect my family. These aren't kind of legal political values. These are moral and religious values. And when it's perceived that, you know, liberals or progressives are coming to take away our guns, it is perceived, we can joke and say, oh, it's like emasculation or castration, but it is actually perceived as an attack on the individual autonomy and humanity of these mostly white, mostly Christian men uh, who are who are kind of you know, leading this movement. And that is, again, just as kind of, I would say, healing from that uh, movement, but also just embedding in it. This is religion. And sometimes it's explicitly tied to religion. Obviously, we saw that uh, every NRA convention has a large presence of, uh, of white Christian nationalists and all of the accoutrements of that of that movement as well. But even even when it's not made explicit, what's at stake is not a constitutional right or constitutional freedom, just as it was, again, just I think in, in past civil rights struggles. What's at stake, except here reversed, is a, is a contestation of the humanity 
of the people involved in the debate. And that calls for a very different way of talking, a way of, of speaking about these, these crises. And I think you're right. Look, I mean, the way we're headed every day is going to be the you know year's anniversary of some mass shooting event. But that is certainly true uh, in the Uvalde case as well. Isn't it? I mean, you, what you're saying just makes a kind of horrifying sense. And, you know, <laughs> you know as, as someone who thinks about freedom of religion a lot, it is very interesting to think about the um, the use of freedom of religion overlaid on the Second Amendment uh, and what a powerful kind of uh, toxic brew that that could be, given the way that people are talking about freedom of religion as an excuse to discriminate, as an excuse to, you know, and then to have that overlaid with guns. I think you're like actually getting at, you know, some some real pathology, uh, you know, sorry to be judgmental, but it feels like a real <laughs> problem that we are facing in this country where guns and freedom of uh, and, and guns and religion um, and a kind of fal- false flag patriotism are coming na- you know, so- into into congruence with one another. It does. It does feel that way. And and even more, I think, than in the religious liberty debates, which, again, you and I have been you know, heavily involved with over the last 15 years. Here it feels even more personal in a sense. You know, there is the sense of my autonomy as a, you know, a, a cake baker is being violated if I have to bake a cake or sell a cake to a same-sex couple, and that is that is how it's understood. Here it feels even more intense. It's my ability to protect my family, to be a man, to be a free person in this society, and you know, the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit might be if, if we could wave a magic wand, which we can't, would be to sort of do away with some of the incitement and disinformation uh, that comes from right wing media. Uh, obviously, nothing can be done around around the NRA, although maybe that's not true. The NRA used to stand for reasonable you know, gun control and gun safety, you know, until the takeover in the 1970s. Um, you know, there's so much it's it's hard to, you know, I was on I was on CNN talking about this recently uh, with a Republican commentator and, and he was saying, well, there's just no trust on on the right. You know, we don't believe we, we know that liberals want to take away all our guns. And I prepared for that. So I actually went and researched some of the official positions. There's a wonderful organization called Every Town for Gun Safety. Sure. Nowhere will you find in their positions the view that, you know, we're, ultimately we want to get rid of all guns. They just not they say the opposite. You know, that yeah. small handguns and things. So it's not the democratic I, position either. The, that's not, not. The, 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 I mean, this is this is this is a made up crisis. It's so interesting that you mentioned the the 1970s takeover of the NRA. And I think the parallel of like the Southern Baptist Convention takeover at the same mm. time. And this is a moment where like the kind of fundamentalist ideology started to kick in both with guns and religion. Uh, on a lot of uh, on the religion side, on a lot of Christian fundamentalist takeover of institutions that had been more moderate or um, conservative, but not but not um, fundamentalist. And now we and now we it's just an interesting kind of conflict. Well, and that what's that responding of. to? Right. I mean, it's right. responding to civil rights in the 1960s. Right. right. Some measure more of, a, of equality uh, for people of color in this country, responding to the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Some more measure of some equality uh, for women. And at that time, for, for gay and lesbian people like the changes which are still contested today. Uh, and which now in some states, you know, in particular Florida, we can't even teach about, right? So it's like this never happened. There never was systemic racism. We're not even allowed to say these words, right? This It's the same, you know, here we are 50 years later, uh, but it does feel like some of the same battle lines that gave birth and to- I completely agree. And look, that takeover happened, extended to the Republican Party. Right. Totally. If you look at Ronald Reagan in the 60s, you know, and you know, he was starting out, he didn't regard the kind of what now is known as the Christian right favorably. You know, he, he thought they were nuts. But then by the time 76 and then 1980 came around, of course, they propelled him to victory in 1980. So that the takeover was also of that party uh, yeah, as well. I, I, I will say about 1980, over an evangelical Christian candidate. That's right. Uh, That's Jimmy right. Carter. I mean, I That's right. Which, of course, gives the lie to the claim that, you know, right. white Christian nationalism is Christian. First and foremost, right? I mean, this yeah. is this is an American white nationalist movement, right? Correct, correct. So interesting, so interesting. I I, I really appreciate all your insight into the Supreme Court, and you know, we've it, it, I, you as you know, like 
I grew up revering the court, as you can imagine. I mean, you know, with with Justice Brandeis, we called him the justice. And, you know, we we had stories about the court and knowing the full story that, you know, Brandeis was in dissent for much of his his time there. But but there was an idea that the court will eventually get it right. And right now, um, I have to say, I, you know, I I have a. I, there's, I'm dismayed by what's happening, and I don't feel like I can look to the Supreme Court to protect my family, to protect um, the people I love. I'm, I'm just wondering how you feel about the court and where we are, where we're headed, and what it means for those of us working for uh, equality of LGBTQ people, uh, but yeah, also no, I, like a diversity of, of a, all kinds of diversity. I look to the Supreme Court to threaten my family, uh, whether right. it's rolling back. If it's not undoing same-sex marriage, then it's certainly limiting what that means. There's already a, a plurality on the court uh, for saying that marriage, some marriages are more equal than others. That's already been decided that just because you have marriage doesn't mean you have all the rights that come with marriage. Um, and that's from my position. Obviously, if I was looking, if I, if I were a person of color looking at this and, and looking at the end of affirmative action, which is now probably this month, uh, right. you know, within the next 30 days, um, you know, this is not a court that's kind of sitting on the sidelines. They're aggressively fighting the culture war uh, from one side. And it is, you know, I, I'm not one of those. I, I, I think I, I see myself as a pragmatist in the way I look at political issues. And so I hesitate to kind of blame, you know, administrations for not doing more and things like that. But there was a period uh, where there was a there there was a, a not, there were enough people in power to have reformed the court and they did nothing. Uh, the Biden commission on the Supreme Court, you know, that looked at a lot of options and then didn't get behind any of them. That that to me was outrageous. And, you know, we're sitting with the Supreme Court and, of course, with the federal judiciary. And look now at this moment, uh, because of Senator Feinstein from California, uh, the Biden administration isn't able to fill as many judicial vacancies uh, as as they would like to do. So there are individual people who are now standing in the way of progress, even, you know, in, in Senator Feinstein's case, somebody who fought for progress her entire life. So there is. We, there really was a missed opportunity uh, to address the court in a more systemic way, in a way that could perhaps have, have led to some hope for more balance. Uh, that ship has sailed. And as you know very well, and, and probably listeners do as well, there's even more money now in the sort of Leonard Leo megalopolis of, uh, of shifting the courts and shifting local governments as well, which appears to be where he's focused now. Well, wow. how money is flowing is like a really underdeveloped. And I, I, I'm very interested in how the money flows with white Christian nationalism, with a lot of these things. Like, how did how are how are all these how are 500 bills all of a sudden in uh, in in legislatures around the country? Like these these things don't happen without money supply, you know, creating the opportunities. And so, say more about what you were just referring to. So I guess it was now. Eight years ago or something like that, I wrote the first kind of long form story on Leonard Leo, who was at that time kind of running the Federalist Society and was the main fixer bringing sort of dark money. We still to this day do not know who funded his network of organizations, and we probably never will. I took over a law school, now the Scalia uh, School of Law, um, and several organizations, the Judicial Crisis Network, also involved with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and of course, the Federalist Society, which was the feeder organization throughout the Trump administration uh, for their judicial picks, and really responsible for the shift in the Supreme Court. Uh, Leonard Leo, extreme religious conservative, happens to be Catholic, is involved uh, not, not just uh, with a number of sort of right-wing Catholic organizations uh, and has been very clear and upfront, as incidentally Bill Barr was when he was attorney general, about the need to reconnect, as in his perspective, uh, American governmental institutions, in particular the courts, to natural law or to sort of Christian uh, morality through a very conservative lens. He's been very successful at that. Obviously, the overturning of Roe versus Wade was a long held goal, uh, achieved that, but not stopping at all. And in fact, once again, uh, there have been, I think it was ProPublica did a fantastic expose. He just got more money uh, through a complicated series of transactions, possibly up to a billion dollars. And the big question was, well, what's he going to do with this enormous amount of money? The answer is now becoming clear 
that the focus is on local and state governments uh, and on some of the changes which we've seen already around trans uh, transgender people, around abortion and around other sort of hot button uh, social issues. This is coming, it seems, it is not, you know, it's hard to get smoking guns when the people are careful on the other side, but this is coming from the same, it seems, from the same networks uh, of dark money. Again, we don't know where some of the funding is coming from. Some we do, some we don't. Um, and this is not some sort of, organic grassroots groundswell right. movement right. Uh, no. this is a carefully and you can look you know as with alec a few years ago which which was coming right. from or from different money from a coke money with different ideology with more of a libertarian ideology uh, you could look at the words of the legislation in different states and it was the same as like exactly you know if my students they would be they'd be you know they'd be thrown out for plagiarism right right and that's because right. this is model legislation that's coming out that's being supported uh by centralized organizations and they are, I don't know if I would say they're winning in the grand scheme. Uh, I still think that they may lose the war, but they're certainly winning enormous battles and putting thousands, if not millions of people uh, at risk. Well, you, you say like they, they may not uh, win the war, but how will they not win the war? Like what do, what, what can we do? I, you know, I, one of the things that you know, there's all people are always saying we don't want to mirror the, what what the Federalist Society is doing, and we don't want to mirror like what the right you know the religious right has done. And I'm kind of like, well, I would I don't love to mirror mir what the religious right is. You know, done. I mean, if, you know, I mean, if that's only my... what the right said about George Soros were true. If only yeah. he commanded these enormous resources that in a shifting society to the left. Right. Unfortunately, and that's the... just an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. But if only right. it were true. No, it's it's amazing, you know. But but it is, you know. Like, oh, we don't want to do that, but but hey, like, shouldn't we be thinking strategically about how we can win? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're like they're in it to win it, and they, you know, they are driven by an ideology which is does not represent the majority of the people, uh, and and they're they're willing to win in order to inflict that ideology on the rest of us, and that is like what is so. So, so frustrating. And um, if any listener is out there with, uh, you know, an, an extra billion or so, I think Jay Michelson <laughs> and I have have an idea about what we might do with it. But I, I just do think it's like uh, what I what gets fr me frustrated is when the when the people on the more progressive side or more liberal side, I'm a pragmatist, too. I mean, I'm not. And, and you know, I'm, I really do believe that there's a there's space for everyone in this country. It's just that no one should be able to inflict their views on all of us. And that's, um, and so, you know, I, I really am eager to figure out strategies, especially over the next 18 months, um, that help us like really put forth a vision and mobilize people around it. It does feel so let me say that, you know, my, I think we'll still win the war quasi optimism, and I'm not an optimist by nature. I think the glass is half empty and the water is evaporating. But, you know, Robbie Jones's work, obviously, on sort of the end of white Christian America, just looking at the trend lines, looking at the demographic changes, looking at where Gen Z is, at least currently, not just on gender, but on, on a host of other issues. Um, you know, I remember when I saw um, in 2016, uh, after the Trump victory, obviously, a lot of us were, you know, deeply disheartened, disillusioned, terrified. And I remember it was right around that time that the Disney film Moana came out. And this was before Ron DeSantis made Disney the, you know, the great enemy of America. But and I thought to myself, you know, this is true. Moana is really going to win, right? Moana, non-white, you know, female hero, not conforming to the sort of traditional, you know, Disney princess stereotype, but somebody empowered. And I thought, well, this is representative of where America is actually headed right to a, a, a future that doesn't look like 1950s America uh, with a certain kind of white male hegemony over everything. And I still think that that's true. And I think the numbers still bear that out. But we can't sit on our hands and just wait for that to happen. Right. I remember actually right. my old boss, I worked for Jerry Nadler back in the 90s. And he oh, said, you wow. know, we could just we could just wait. You guys are going to he said to a, a, an LGBT group, he said, you guys are going to win eventually. We could just sit and wait. But we can't afford to do that, right? We can't yeah. sit, wait a few decades for this to happen. We have to make this change happen. And he said right. that to his credit. I think that was 1993, 94, something like that. And, right. Um, right. and I think that's true here as well. You know, we can't allow whether it's it, trans people or immigrants or, you know, any variety of number of groups that are being targeted by the hard right uh, to simply wait and bear the brunt of this attack. Uh, but I, I do believe that in a certain way, this is a, and again, this is cribbing a bit from, from, uh, 
uh, the end of white Christian America, that this is in a certain way a, a reaction to a true thing that is happening. It is yeah, true right. that this kind of hegemony is declining. But I always thought, you know, among my more left wing friends, where it's like we're going to smash the patriarchy. The patriarchy is going to smash back. Right. And that's right. what's happening. It's not just right. going to sit there and wait to be hit by a sledgehammer. That's not how it's going to work. And I, I think we are seeing that happen for me in the, in the next 18 months. It's it is incredibly challenging and frustrating that a number of groups uh, who traditionally used to be in the sort of more progressive column or the Democratic column, even if not progressive, are now uh, seemingly flirting with the right. And I think, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Latino or Latinx populations. I'm thinking about increasing numbers of Asian American populations, API populations, people who, you know, are seeing themselves in a position that they think is closer to Republican Party positions. Um, and are willing to put up with a lot uh, to, to sort of move a in a particular way. And I wish the Democrats could kind of get with it more, uh, diversify their own leadership, diversify the way that they talk, and that there, that has been happening a little bit, and make way for a new generation of leadership that, that looks different, sounds different, comes from different backgrounds. And right now it's this very frustrating phenomenon where some core constituencies for if not radical change at least some kind of incremental liberal change are no longer it seems with that with that program mm. and you know i just feel like there's a space here for progressive faith organizations if they have the courage to speak in different languages and i'm not saying abandon any core commitments or anything right. like that or or right. even but just reaching out in ways that might broaden the tent um, the mainstream Republican Party has abandoned mainstream Christianity, right? I don't mean just progressive lefty Christianity and you know and Judaism. I mean the mainstream. And you know it is true. Obviously, we all know your know, mainline denominations are decreasing in, in numbers and in power. But there's still a lot of folks uh, who are not on board. Let's take it back to guns, right? They may not. They're certainly not going to be on board with. Uh, you know, taking away people's guns entirely. But again, no one's proposing that anyway. But the further the the more the extremists control one of the two major parties, uh, the more space there should be for bridge building. And it just pains me, you know, so many progressive organizations and progressive faith organizations, you know, are inward looking. And again, I don't want to minimize the importance of doing the work in inside as well. But uh, as we approach 2024, there is so much opportunity I think for looking outward uh, and building bridges to communities which are not, they're not on board with either extreme, uh, but they are on board with what I might call a sort of centristy, compassion based faith perspective uh, uh -huh. that does not want to demonize whole populations, that does not want to perpetuate violence against parts of our population, and that does not support the sort of extreme religiosity of the NRA gun religion uh, that any uh, common sense gun safety regulation is a personal affront to my autonomy. Mainstream middle America does not believe that. Uh, and there is an opportunity for, I think, for faith organizations to speak with them. Let me switch to uh, the, the, the Biden administration has just launched a major initiative around anti-Semitism. And I, I'm curious how you view the manifestation of anti-Semitism now. I'll just we are um, we are part of that initiative in that we we just released a new resource mobilizing against anti-Semitism that is being sent out to our networks across the country. Um, meant to be a resource, not to kind of prescribe exactly what everybody has to do, but to ensure that people don't feel paralyzed when they um, when they step into this area, and really to you know encourage some sort of uh, gathering of of a community and say no one in our community should be the target of hate or or violence or um, rhetoric that demeans them. So I'm just curious how you understand what is happening with anti-Semitism right now in America and uh, the way you c imagine addressing that most, um, most compellingly and, uh, and effectively. That's a big one. You know, I've been working on this for a long time. I worked in the Jewish journalism field for 10 years, uh, columnist for The Forward, which is the largest Jewish newspaper in the in the country, and involved in a lot of this work. It is, uh, it's difficult work, to put it mildly, um, because there's just, there's just, it's very hard to find common ground within 
the well-meaning people who want to fight anti-Semitism, right? There's a lot of different manifestations and forms of anti-Semitism. Many, uh, you know, including the Anti-Defamation League, are now committed to the view that certain criticisms of the state of Israel are, are ipso facto uh, anti-Semitic. Many others of us strongly disagree with that perspective. There is also distinctions. There are different kinds of anti-Semitism, right? So there is what I would see is by far the most important, powerful and dangerous and worrisome one is right wing nationalist anti-Semitism. The idea that someone like Nick Fuentes could be sitting down with a former president who's now the leading the front runner for the Republican nomination. I cannot believe that any American Jew is willing to kind of put up with that or see that as as well. That's OK. I don't have to agree with Trump on everything. I mean, he's he's sitting down with a neo-Nazi. I mean, it's, it's off the charts, right? And then there are other forms of, of anti-Semitism as well. You know, there's been a real, a, a good understandable hesitancy and reluctance among progressive in progressive communities to kind of look at anti-Semitism in the black community. Uh, obviously, we don't want to fall into some of the racist weaponizations of this phenomenon, which we have already seen, but it is also a phenomenon. It's a daily phenomenon for uh, ultra-Orthodox or Hasidic appearing Jews in New York City. Uh, who are in, you know, experiencing day-to-day -day harassment. That's a different set of ideolo ideologies. And they kind of come together. I wrote a, I won a nice award for this uh, uh, article I wrote on, yes, there are a lot of Jews in Hollywood, let a rabbi explain why, uh, in Rolling Stone, responding to Kanye West, talking about this age-old conspiracy theory about the Jews con controlling Hollywood, and looking at some of the historical reasons why there are a lot of Jews in the entertainment industry, which I think are really interesting. Uh, and again, I'm really gratified that that kind of piece found an, uh, an audience. But that's also a slightly different ideology. It's related. It obviously has some of the same targets. And so it's a really, it's, it's just not what I wish we could do would be to unify around maybe just one or two of these forms. So how about we just unify around nationalist neo-Nazi anti-Semitism and agree to disagree about some of the other manifestations? Because again, for me, if you look at the Tree of Life shooting, or if you look at some of the more horrifying incidents of anti-Semitic violence, it tends to come from that side. But you know, I'm talking to you from my home uh, in, in New Jersey, and one mile away from where I'm sitting, there was a very small anti-Semitic attack, but still a, a, a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a Reformed temple a mile away from me. Um, no one was hurt. The security cameras captured the guy. They caught the guy. And I was, I was talking with the leadership of that temple. And we were wondering, you know, which kind, who is, who's it going to be, right? I mean, was this going to be a sort of white nationalist? Was it going to be someone inspired by Kanye West, maybe from a black community? Or was it going to be someone from a Muslim community? And in a sense, it didn't matter, right? It's the same temple being attacked. But in looking at how to respond, it matters a lot. Because right. these, these are people coming from different places, different ideological uh, backgrounds, and obviously different backgrounds um, as well. And that's what makes it so challenging. I wish we could just kind of, and I think there is hope for this, but again, it's been so, the, the discourse has been so poisoned by a kind of right-wing ideological machine on the hard right to the right of Fox News, you know, kind of Newsmax, which is now, you know, getting higher ratings than CNN, uh, you know, that, that any talk of this is somehow partisanized. It should not be that way. Right. Right. I, I, I think you there are there are that's exactly what we tried to do is like exactly not get paralyzed, but really look at your local community, reach out to, you know, local, um, you know, if you are a Jewish leader, you know, advancing this idea and inviting people in. If you're if you are not inviting Jewish leaders, family members, uh, friends into a conversation, what is the manifestation that you're seeing and and invite people into a unified response, which is basically human to human. There's a lot of I mean, I think it's, you, you painted it um, a, 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 a compellingly disturbing picture. And yet there are, in some ways it does. It shouldn't stop us from taking the next step, which is ensuring that our Jewish family, friends, neighbors are safe and, and feel supported and that we will show up for one another. And I think that's the important thing. No, absolutely. Um, and, and I can say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at, there's a Jewish holiday coming up uh, and I'm speaking at, at a sort of community uh, gathering for it. People don't feel safe. And right. it's hard to say, just feel safe uh, when these low, both low level, I don't want to say low level, I don't want to minimize it, but let's say local, smaller incidents of violence are happening. And again, we're on a national level. 
you know, it's like wrapped up in the whole mainstreaming of whether it's QAnon or other right wing conspiracy theories. You know, it almost always ends up with anti-Semitism. And, you know, we see it around conversations around Soros. We see it from Elon Musk. We see it from some of the most powerful people in our country. And it's not we're not like ringing some super snowflake woke bell of like, this is a, you know, I'm disturbed or I don't feel, you know, I feel uncomfortable. We're noticing exactly what's being said and what's being mainstreamed. And we've been here before. We know exactly where this leads when you demonize and otherize, uh, you know, this a, a Jewish conspiracy or something like that. And, and it, it leads to the worst possible imaginable places. Yeah. I mean, I have I have friends and family who are considering leaving America who are Jewish. And I, yeah, you know, I'm, and I'm I, not and there, I know, but I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, and, but and, I, I and resonate I, with it. I mean, I, yeah, you know, I yeah. get it. And, and, get and it. one of the most shocking things I've heard is like Jewish Americans considering Germany as a place to move to. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's like when that is actually right. on the table, it may not happen, but it, when it's on the table, you have to realize something is wrong. I mean, you know, that's no shade against Germany, but it is like kind of like, oh, that's uh, that's a real indictment. Listen, well, and again, I, it's like this is close to the leadership of the Republican Party. This is not some weird, you know, there's always been there's always been the like 10 percent of every population that has just terrible you know, racist views, anti-Semitic views, whatever. That's always that's around the world. It's like sometimes it's twelve percent, sometimes eighteen percent. This is the the current front runner for the nomination, very closely meeting with people who have extreme views. And this is someone who obviously a lot of Jews love, right? Donald Trump for because he was so uh, good on Israel, but in the sort of larger sense of where this wing of the party is moving and who they're willing to sit down and talk with, it's extremely disturbing. Yeah. I, I, I will offer a slight caveat. Um, he was good on Israel, according to some people. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. According to their, <laughs> according to their view of uh, what good on Israel means. Of course, um, of course. I, I mean, I, I, Interfaith Alliance does not take positions on Israel and Palestine, but I, I, I will say that I, I didn't want you to get, um, uh, you know, your your social media get blown up for that one moment. Oh um, yeah, my 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 uh, <laughs> my ratios all come from the right. I get a little bit of left wing attack, but nowadays it's pretty okay. clear. Okay. Okay. Who, uh, who um, hates me hey, the most? I, I like to to end with um, asking every guest what gives them hope. So I'm going to do that to you. you, you you're a you're a I think you said glass half empty and evaporating kind of guy. So um, <laughs> you know, that's a that's a that's a that's a, a winner of a image. Um, but but still, what does give you hope uh, for the hope that you do have? So, and my hope is data driven uh, on this, uh, which maybe makes it not hope, but that's that's where I, I'm at with it. When, you know, there are plenty of reasonable Republicans out there, obviously, to say the obvious, but when the party is captured in this way, they make mistakes and they get ahead of their skis and they've done it on abortion, right? And that gives me a lot of hope because suburban white women who might vote for either party are not going to vote for a party that is, you know, is, is passing six week abortion bans. And we're seeing that in South Carolina with uh, the coalition, you know, that they just lost, but with uh, with the coalition of Republican women uh, against uh, that six week abortion ban, which now just passed. Um, that gives me hope when they get ahead of their skis. I think they're over their skis a little bit on um, on trans issues as well. A lot of Americans have concerns uh, or misgivings. Uh, they don't know about trans people. Or they don't know trans people personally. So there's a lot of work to be done. It reminds me of where we were on LGBT, LGB people 25 years ago. Um, but when we do get to know people who are different from us, there are capacities of human decency and compassion, uh, which I try to nourish in my work as a rabbi and a meditation teacher, which do emerge. Um, that gives me hope. Um, if you look at the way people are lying about trans people right now. It's so far away from reality that if these folks would just sit down with someone trans, they would right. see that we're, that this isn't how it is. And so right. ironically, the, when the, when the, when one side becomes so enamored with its own rhetoric, you know, that they're eating their own dog food is the, is the metaphor that we used to use the, you know, that they're really believing this stuff and they're going too far and they are going too far for where the middle is. Forget about the left. That does give me a kind of hope. Hmm. Your hope lies in the mistakes of others. Uh, listen. <laughs> 
Listen, Jay Michelson, it is great to talk to you. As always, be prepared for many future invitations. You're you're just a real treasure, and uh, and I, I appreciate you uh, being with us today on State of Belief Radio. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate it. And with that, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this week's show. We need your help keeping State of Belief on the air. I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And you can also be a part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like these are heard by sharing this program with family and friends. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part in the conversations both on and off the air. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the weekly State of Belief podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And join the conversation. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. Coming up next weekend, we're planning a major announcement about a big step forward in growing State of Belief and the impact this program can have. So make sure you're here for that. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Rauschenbusch on the State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.